Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan, and the podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. Liquidware, the innovator in adaptive workspace management solutions, and also brought to you by ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work-from-anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. And of course, also brought to you by Policy Pack Software, now part of Networks, where you use Group Policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lockdown applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. If you enjoy the show each week, give these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. On last week's episode of the podcast, I covered some of the Patch Tuesday news as that had just come to be. And much like in other months, the following episode, which would be this one for this month, covers some of the issues that occurred that were caused by these patches. So first up, Citrix published a Citrix article, CTX338544, where they indicate issues after installing Microsoft Updates KB59546, 58877, or 595.46. After installing these patches, the Citrix PVS SOAP server service doesn't start anymore. And when trying to start the service, it crashes right away. And while this happens, the Citrix PVS API service also stops working. They state that the event logs are SOAP server.exe crashes event 1000. .NET event 1026 after the January server 2016 monthly updates that are installed. And particularly concerning in this case, they note that this issue occurs even if the updates are only applied to the Active Directory domain controllers and not yet applied to the PVS server. So if you're wondering, hey, why is this happening? I haven't even installed those patches yet on my PVS servers. If your Active Directory domain controllers have been patched, that's why it's happening. Luckily, there is a workaround. There is a skip forest level trusts D word registry value that you could set under HKey local machine software Citrix provisioning services. You can set that to one. And I'll share a link to the CTX article with this episode, which is episode 213. You'll find that on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links for this episode. It's easier to just go to the article and read what registry it is rather than have to drill in through the registry after hearing me call out the directory. And rolling on with some bad patch news, but on last week's episode of the podcast, I talked about out-of-band patches being released by Microsoft. And I advise that, as always, with out-of-band patches, you need to download those yourself and deploy. They won't install automatically. Well, more out-of-band patches have now been released to address several issues related to VPN connections, domain controllers, and Hyper-V caused by this month's Patch Tuesday updates. Petri.com reports that the out-of-band updates are now available for all supported versions of Windows, that includes the desktop operating systems like Windows 11, Windows 10, Windows 7, and all Windows Server as well. Microsoft stated on the Windows Health dashboard that, quote, Microsoft is releasing out-of-band updates today, January 17th, 2022, for some versions of Windows. This update addresses issues related to VPN connectivity, Windows Server domain controllers restarting, virtual machine start failures, and REFS formatted removable media failing to mount. Last week, Microsoft confirmed that the latest updates trigger VPN connectivity problems on both Windows 10 and Windows 11 devices. And in addition to these VPN connection issues, IT administrators reported that Windows Server domain controllers are affected by constant reboots, Hyper-V startup, and resilient file system accessibility issues. I think what's a really bad look on Microsoft in this instance is the VM startup issue in Hyper-V. It seems really wild to me that that issue was missed somehow during their own internal testing. 
Hopefully they didn't just rush this out without properly testing, but it kind of seems that way. So regardless, if you're experiencing any of those issues, you may want to try to bring on these out of band patches. A few months ago, I covered the story of SUSE acquiring New Vector, who make a really great container security platform that provides visibility of your container dependencies and just network topology and mapping. Well, SUSE have taken the step to now make New Vector the first ever open source container security platform. I have a pretty dated blog post on my site about New Vector that shows some of the value and you can find the SUSE New Vector source code for the preview release at the New Vector GitHub page. So if you're into containers, you're into Kubernetes, Docker, the fact that this is now open source could be a great benefit to the community, so you may want to check this out. BleepyComputer.com reported this week that Microsoft Edge has added a new feature to the beta channel that will mitigate future in-the-wild exploitation of unknown zero-day vulnerabilities. The new capability is part of a new browsing mode designed to focus on the Microsoft Edge's security while navigating the web. They state that when turned on, this feature brings hardware-enforced stack protection, arbitrary code guard, and content flow guard as supporting security mitigations to increase user security on the web. In the release notes for the latest Microsoft Edge beta version, Microsoft also mentions the addition of a custom primary password that will allow users to add an extra authentication step before saved passwords are auto-filled in web forms. A former Google engineer posted a really fascinating history on the Google Chrome installer this week on Twitter. He went through how they wanted to make sure it had at least a 95% success rate and that anybody could use it. He talked about when deploying it internally that they just had a portable EXE that they could give people to use in order to use Chrome. He also discussed how the horrible user experience on Vista led them to using their own custom installer rather than MSI and that it was also behind the reasoning to put the executable and the files in a user location. And if I can quote him for a moment, he also said, quote, all in all, the result is that, parentheses, in my honest opinion, close parentheses, Chrome has one of the most reliable installers updaters you can find anywhere in the Windows ecosystem. But that required ditching most Microsoft best practices. That is the price. Sorry, not sorry. He goes on to say that there has never been a time when it felt we could go back to the MSI path. For example, Microsoft won't let you set the registry keys to become the default browser. Nowadays, you literally have to play a YouTube tutorial so the user does this four-step dance. So they said they haven't gone back to the MSI path, which is still fair for the consumer version. However, obviously, there's the enterprise version that's available to download as an MSI. And the way they're using the MSI is ugly. <laughs> they're not using the MSI properly. It's just embedding in their own custom installer within the binary table and then calling it to install via the custom action table. But hey, maybe this is why they're doing that. They're really just using the MSI as a wrapper because they don't want to use the MSI properly. Regardless, I found it very interesting. And speaking of interesting and also about installers and packaging, kind of awkward segue, uh, there's an interesting poll on Reddit to gauge use and interest in MSIX. So the question is pretty simple. Do you deploy MSIX packages in your infrastructure? So far at the time of this recording, there has been 316 votes with the majority of people voting no. <laughs> and the second largest voting went to no, I don't even know what MSIX is. In fact, the only yes responses were 16 said yes, they are using it. 21 said yes, but only if I don't have another option because MSIX is lacking. So I've talked at length about MSIX. I've also blogged about it. If you're a frequent listener to the podcast, you probably already know my stance on it. But I would be in the not yet, but we are evaluating category. 
and it's been a long evaluation because I'm not going to move forward out of the evaluating phase until packaging new applications into MSIX and more importantly converting my existing packages into MSIX is easier like the juice has to be worth the squeeze and right now it's not compelling enough to go through that squeeze but it'd be interesting to hear more people's feedback so I'll share a link to this poll if you'd like to vote the more people who vote the more interesting the results are going to be and there's only one day and 10 hours left so if you're listening to this episode as it's published, there's going to be less than 24 hours left to vote, so vote quick. BleepyComputer.com reported this week that the widgets in use by Microsoft and Windows 11 will soon be opened up so developers can create their own. While Microsoft has not shared any details on this yet, there are some leaked documents that show Microsoft will distribute third-party widgets through the Microsoft Store like other third-party applications. It also shows that developers will be able to create web widgets likely to be used in Microsoft's Edge. Web widgets are said to be a new feature rolling out in Microsoft Edge that opens a small sidebar that can run even with the browser closed, displaying things like the current news and weather. So probably much like that little weather pop-up thing that's in Windows 10 and Windows 11, I'm sure VDI admins are going to love this. Not. Sophos security blog reported a pretty worrying Apple vulnerability. The vulnerability allows private data to leak between separate browser tabs that contain content from unrelated websites. The amount of data that leaks is said to be minuscule. So you know the way you can open a new tab and browse to the same site that you're currently on in one of your other tabs and it remembers maybe like your authentication or some other filled in information that you already put in on the other tab. Well, that's a great convenience to have, but that functionality here may be allowing others to potentially manipulate and gather sensitive data from your machine. The vulnerability in question is in their web kit that is used in Safari across all operating systems. But as the report also suggests, the web kit is a requirement for use by all browsers on iOS and iPadOS. So it's not going to be just limited to Safari on iOS and iPadOS. It's going to apply to all browsers that are available. Hopefully this is one that Apple will patch soon. Though to be honest, their history on quickly patching these types of things is a little rocky. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Law enforcement authorities from 10 countries took down a VPN service provider used by ransomware operators and malware actors. Europol coordinated efforts that involved simultaneous law enforcement actions in Germany, the Netherlands, Canada, the Czech Republic, France, Hungary, Latvia, Ukraine, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The law operatives seized 15 servers used by VPNlab.net and took down its main site so the platform is no longer available. According to a bleepycomputer.com report, this particular service had been used in at least 150 ransomware attacks. As a direct result of these actions, VPNlab.net incurred financial damages of at least 60 million euros. Lee, but it begs the question, how much do they make? Maybe that's just a drop in the ocean. ZDNet had an interesting article that was kind of a, you know, a year in review type of story, uh, but they suggested that more than 2,300 local government schools and healthcare organizations in the U.S. were affected by ransomware attacks in 2021. And this is via a report from security company MCSoft. The company found that at least 77 state and municipal governments, 1,043 schools, and 1,023 healthcare providers were impacted by a ransomware incident last year. The attacks also led to 118 data breaches, exposing troves of sensitive information. The report estimates that the 77 incidents that I mentioned just earlier amounted to 623.7 million in losses. And to kind of flip the script a little bit and maybe 
do predictions based off of data from the past and surveys that were taken last year. Uh, this week, ZDNet also covered a Gartner report that predicted IT spending could potentially exceed pre-pandemic levels by growing 5.1% this year, reaching a total of $4.5 trillion. The IT services segment, which includes consulting and management services, is expected to reach $1.3 trillion, which will be up 7.9% from 2021. And what I found interesting in this report, and it's something that I've actually said in my own blog posts, and even in an article that I guess published on another blog at the beginning of last year, but the report states that 2021 was about improving and stabilizing most of the stuff that was done in 2020 with a little bit of optimization. But now we have companies going, all right, we know where we have been. We know what worked during the pandemic. We probably know where we want to be. So I'm actually going to dig up that article because (laughs) the article that I published in 2021, I predicted that there wasn't going to be, well, I'm going off memory here. I may be completely wrong or maybe they editorialized the article since it's not published on my site. But I was suggesting that in 2021, companies weren't necessarily going to be trying to boil the ocean, right? They had the tools that they had when the pandemic hit. They had to work with whatever they had. They weren't necessarily ramping up and buying new products and onboarding them and trying to make a really awesome experience. They were just trying to cope and get by. And I predicted that in 2021, they were probably going to try to fine tune what they had and improve with what they already had, whilst also potentially starting to look down the road at what they can test with a view of maybe implementing it in 2022 and beyond. So it seems like this Gardner article somewhat aligns with what I had predicted last year. So, hey, I always talk smack about myself not being a big picture thinker, but it seems like I got one thing right. Although, hey, maybe Gardner are wrong and I'm wrong. (laughs) I guess we'll see. In a follow-up to a previous story I covered, the rollout of 5G in the U.S. continues to be delayed due to concerns from the aviation industry. NBC reports that Verizon and AT&T will temporarily limit 5G service around some airports. Verizon stated, quote, The Federal Aviation Administration and our nation's airlines have not been able to fully resolve navigating 5G around airports, despite it being safe and fully operational in more than 40 other countries, end quote. So that did not sound salty at all (laughs) by saying, hey, this isn't a problem in the other 40 countries, so what's going on here? Um, So the last time I covered this, I mentioned the fact that, you know, I jumped to that conclusion myself. You know, the fact other cities around the world have switched on 5G quite some time ago. I couldn't understand why it was a problem in the U.S., but not elsewhere. So I did a little Googling. Now, there wasn't a whole lot on the subject, but I did find one article. So because it can't really be verified against others and there wasn't a whole lot on the topic, at least at the time of recording this. Uh, But a report on Barons.com suggested a difference in the 5G rollout in the U.S. versus Europe. And that difference is that Europe opted to use a lower frequency than the U.S. And as the U.S. is using a higher frequency, they are using a frequency which is closer to the standard frequency used by altimeters that are critical for the safety of flight. There was a suggestion that they may need to have a couple of mile exclusion zone around airport runways in the United States. So again, I'm not an expert in this field. There wasn't a whole lot of info out there to verify this, but I found it pretty interesting nonetheless, and it at least sounds plausible, I guess. So I'm sure this story will roll on for another few weeks. And finally, in the news, If I can do a little plug for my employer and also show sponsor real quick. But there's new cool Azure and Azure Virtual Desktop things coming to control up Realtime DX. And they've put the call out and the offer for those in the community who are willing to be the first to test it out. If you're interested, you can reach out to me, DM me on Twitter at Rory Mon 
or you could DM at control up and we'll work to get you set up. Well, that's it for the news. Let's go to a scripts, tricks and tips segment. So I've only got one this week, I'm trying to keep it short, keep it light. But I saw that Uday Hedge blogged about Azure Active Directory Workload Identity Federation with Kubernetes. And the post explores how services running in a Kubernetes cluster can also use the capabilities to access Azure resources and no secrets are necessary. And it goes through how you can leverage those Azure resources from a running Kubernetes cluster. Well, that's it for another episode. I was going to include my own blog post, but I haven't got around to actually publishing it yet. So maybe next week I'll have something in the scripts, tricks, and tips that I actually created myself. Well, that's it for another episode of the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening.